Does this work? Oh, yes, it does. Okay. Okay, now, uh, break, if you will. We will proceed in an entirely different fashion. We will proceed in German, first of all. And we'll be talking about a different subject altogether. And uh, it would it would have been very interesting to have uh, a discussion afterwards in order to ar align these subjects, you know, because I myself as a Greek person would have wished for Greece to be able to participate in this new Euro-Asian kind of uh, train network. Because, uh, you know, I'll be talking about Greece. And as you've already heard, um, well, I will not mention the word war, but the word of colony, which is no less drastic as a concept. When uh, I was first told about the title of this festival a hundred years of now, I had the one association, of course, and that was the association of, you know, the state of being or the status quo that uh, Mark Fisher described in his book on capitalist realism. You may be familiar with that book. Mark Fisher, in his book on capitalist realism, describes that uh, being realistic today or being a realist today means to say that Fukuyama was right, which... Uh, amounts to agreeing to the fact that the history is over and that now, the presence of now is now eternal. And he says that capitalism is the diachronic and the only present state of societies into all imaginable times. That we are living in the time that is eternally the same and where everything will just be prolonged into the future and no major changes should be expected and time or the future as a sign of change would stop. The time would stop ticking and this is capitalist realism and this is what I thought is a kind of a secondary theory behind this subject or the, the motto of uh, hundred years of now. And Mark Fisher says that we're living in a capitalist limbo where time is being recycled in a circular fashion. And I met Mark Fisher last spring and we talked about whether this theory actually is right, that we are living in the eternal now, that we are imprisoned in capitalist limbo for all times. Because I told him that based on my experiences in Greece, which I'll be talking about today, based on these experiences, I had the impression that this crisis actually um, made major cracks into this theory and that the time is now free again and it flows freely again and that we can no longer say what would happen in the future and that, you know, changes are possible in all kinds of directions, both in the direction of dystopies and utopias, uh, dystopias and utopias. So we had this uh, discussion about whether we are still in a state of limbo or whether the future is now open and uh, can be newly designed. And based on this feeling on time, I would like to give you first a short description on the situation in Greece that imparted this new uh, idea on time on me and which will then lead over to my subject. So what has been going on in Greek? In Greece, we've had a very, very moving Greek summer. And during the last couple of years in Greece, we actually had the experience of a rapidly faster time, you know, a kind of denser time. So now I'm talking 10 days after the last election. And when we pinned down the title of this presentation, it was by no means clear that there would be elections in the first place. I find myself in the situation time and again that we are in, uh, you know, flowing political times that I'm coming up with theories that, uh, you know, within a week can be outdated again. So what does this mean in concrete terms? Well, over the last six years, in Greek, there were four elections, one referendum, six different governments were formed, innumerable general strikes and protest movements. And we know all that. And the, in short, we can say that there was a total state of political instability in the country. Parties were founded and within only six months disappeared again. And every government that tried to implement the memoranda never succeeded except for a couple uh, succeeded in remaining in office except for a couple of months so political instability 
And now, after the last elections on the 20th of September, finally, um, things are supposed to, um, to, to quiet down. A sense of peace and stability is now being expected because now people expect that one thing will be possible, which was not possible in the past, and that is to get the signature of the sovereign, that is the acceptance of the citizens in Greek in order to implement the program of the Troika. That was so special about Greece, by the way, that uh, if uh, politicians tried or whenever politicians tried to implement measures, it was the population that actually turned things upside down and made things not implementable. And now, um, only recently, the Polish prime minister congratulated Alexis Tsipras, and he congratulated uh, him not for waking up himself, so to speak, but for his population to vote for a referendum. So now it uh, see, looks like the population is legitimizing the memorandum. But we know that this program that was now also ratified by the population, if you will, that there were no many um, Alternatives. An Ochi voter, um, blogger in Greece, said that these mute elections, as they were called in Greece, that they were absolutely unnecessary and they only served to keep up the idea of an existing democracy because Europe has unmistakably made clear that there are no other alternatives com uh, than this program of the Troika. So, what have we experienced in Greece? It really is a textbook example of the post-democratic uh, paradigm because the sovereign, that is the people, was only asked after in August the political framework had been laid down on a decree basis. So Cyprus, who had taken over the helm in Greece, was then forced, as we know, by the argument of uh, the debts and the strangulation by the ECB. And then it was the 13th of July where this forced uh, agreement was called This is a Coup. The international uh, community actually called this a coup. Greece, ever since it was said, it was uh, treated like a debt protectorate. And the independent political magazine Unfollow titled that uh, about uh, Greece that in colonies you don't need a coup. And this is a title that I borrowed from my presentation because, first of all, I thought that it was nice and drastic, and I also thought that it uh, was necessary to tell a German audience that, you know, in Greece these uh, heavy terms and concepts like colonialism and coup are being discussed, and but this is also a kind of discourse that quite frequently is being touched upon but is never really discussed in detail, and that is that Greece structurally is now a form of a new colony inside of Europe. And that is actually what I would like to talk about today. Now, uh, to add as to why I chose this title, the, I chose the title before the elections, even before elections uh, were announced. And it was a kind of a prophecy, um, you know, kind of a prophetic move of me to choose that because after the memorandum was pushed through in parliament, um, a coup was no longer necessary. But, you know, only free democratic elections were necessary in order to ratify this memorandum. So what about the time and how time flows? Could we say that after this memorandum, after this election, is everything set back to zero? Is time frozen in Greece? Are we back in the expectable limbo of neocolonialism? Well, I would like to talk about these drastic concepts and terms. And uh, I was inspired to do that by the title of the overall conference, you know, and it's looking for diagnosing the time and to getting the past back into the present and uh, to look at normative time narratives and to question these. And that's why this is a kind of an experiment of mine to deal with this complex of subjects that may seem outdated, that may be something that you would position in a different century, and the terms may sound anachronistic and polemic. But, you know, this kind of a connection between a debt-informed capitalist crisis, post-democracy, and an economic form of neocolonialism. And this whole complex of subjects, that is debts, uh, post-colonialism, and uh, uh, these things, this is not entirely new outside of Europe, of course, and which is why I'm not going to be telling you anything much that might be new to you. But what I want to do is to really go through 
all the different uh, theories of uh, post-colonial research and try to translate them to uh, today, to Europe of today, and to look at the role of Greece and Germany in that context. Now, to me, it's uh, you know this is a new idea and a new way of thinking, and I'm seeing this presentation rather as a form of acting and not just imparting information, because I actually also want to provoke a discussion. You know, in order to find out whether we can actually talk about this as a theory. You know, I mean, there are many people talking about Greece as a protectorate based on debts, but I never really um, read any longer text on this kind of idea that would go into the details of the idea. And so I uh, really, for the fun of it, uh, did some research uh, looking at writers that look at the crisis in Greece and in Europe outside, of, who are themselves sitting outside of Europe and who have an experience in uh, economic colonialism. And they, of course, are of the opinion that uh, Europe and Greece has a lot more in common with the Global South than they would ever be willing to admit. Uh, Raimaya Samata, for example, the director of the Calcutta Research Group, writes in an article to call the country in Europe a post-colony could be considered an insult. Colonialism and post-colonialism and the neo-colonial destinies for others, countries and nations and peoples outside the Europe uh, North Atlantic world. And uh, he moves on and uh, says that he is really astonished about the fact that people in Europe still assume that they are something like a natural democracy, that they have a natural inclination for democracy because the idea of Europe is linked to uh, justice, freedom, and democracy, and that it really is absolutely um, unfathomable to leave this kind of framework. And there are also commentators who uh, refer to the uh, European exceptionalism in this context. Like, for example, Yaya Tigosh, who is a professor for economic studies in New Delhi, and she argues that the debt crisis of the European periphery is anything but new, but is uh, actually following a written script uh, which only serves to uh, put Greece into the long queue of countries of the South that are indebted to the remaining countries of the West. So what does neocolonialism actually mean? Neocolonialism in post-colonial studies is seen as a geopolitical practice that uh, uses uh, economic um, procedures of uh, in transnational companies and international institutions like International Monetary Fund and uh, the World Bank in order to influence uh, political decisions and instead of exerting direct military control, as in the case of colonialism. This is a term that uh, Kovami Nurma, as the first Ghana, Ghanaian president, uh, used in 1965 in order to describe Ghana. And he, for example, says that the essence of neocolonialism is that the state uh, which is subject to it, uh, which in theory is independent, and has all the outward trappings of international sovereignty. But in reality, its economic system and thus its political policy is directed from outside. So, uh, and uh, Sartre also in his book on colonialism and neocolonialism, and Fanon also talk about neocolonialism as something that uh, in the most of the cases happened after the decolonialization of the former colonies that uh, then were seen as free countries, independent countries, but because of a dominant economic presence in trade and finances in the field of exploring natural resources, there, of course, was still a major influence in the respective countries. And we also know that the mechanism for that uh, are debts. Uh, David Graeber talked a lot about that. I'm not going to delve into the details here now, but debt throughout history have been a mechanism uh, that uh, enabled people to exert power, you know, or nations to exert power over other nations also in order to legit legitimize political power. And this debt mechanism has become apparent, of course, especially in the global south during the 70s and 80s when Asia and Latin America were given loans by the World Bank and the IMF that were linked to political reform conditions, the so-called structural um, reforms that were then carried out. We all know this, and this is uh, an, nothing new. The structural adjustment programs, well, what are these? Just in short, these are programs uh, for the complete restructuring of the economy and the society. They affect 
fiscal and monetary and economic policy activities, but also the question of the public budget. That is the reduction of public expenditure, the taxation, the number of civil servants, uh, the level of uh, of wages, then investors, protection, deregulation of markets, and these measures are all being used by the uh, creditor uh, by the by the um, creditor countries and these uh, strange uh, intergovernmental organisations that are not uh, really. Um, that, that are beyond parliamentary control, like the, uh, for example, uh, currency banks or the international banking bodies like the World Bank. And this is the uh, really a situation like we can see in Greece right now. The parallels are very clear. The memorandum treaty has uh, is really shows all the features of a structural adjustment programs. We know that the conditions for further loans, that is the third so-called financial aid program, uh, were actually linked to uh, the lowering of the minimum wage and uh, the lowering of the uh, pensions and the increase of pensioning age and the privatization of strategically important uh, infrastructure elements like the 14 airports that were then privatized and sold to Fraport. So these are panels, but there is what it really is an interesting difference in the case of Greece is that the mechanisms of structural adjustment programs based on debt is now happening inside of Europe. So Greece itself is part of the body to which it has a kind of new colonial relationship of dependency. So what can we learn about Europe when looking at the situation? Well, Europe for quite some time boasted um, about being a continent without a center, that it's an alliance of countries and states that's based on the equal rights of all partners. But now we get to see that uh, at least at the latest after the uh, financial crisis, there are hierarchies between European states uh, based on the relationship between creditors and debtors. This, in its core, is down to a development that I would like to describe with the words of Josef Fogel, which is a step-by-step -step, uh, movement towards an economic sovereignism. And so in Europe, formally speaking, politically speaking, there is an equal rights basis for all partners, but uh, because of the fact that Europe quite systematically um, is carrying out um, the transference of, of power from the parliaments to independent uh, players of the uh, trading and the financial world. This is a kind of economic sovereignism, and that means that, uh, politically speaking, equal rights are no longer that important against the backdrop that we have now an economic hierarchy inside of the body of the European Union. And this, of course, is linked to the overall subject of post-democracy. Uh, Joseph Fogel, in his last book, Souveraineté's Effect, describes this and, and says that these mechanisms of losing democracy is a part of today's uh, um, actions of uh, governments. And he says that there is a new style of government in Europe and uh, elsewhere in the world, really, that uh, decision making is uh, now being imparted in a network between international bodies um, and, and international banking bodies in a gray zone between politics and uh, the private industry. And this new, these new uh, governing agents, uh, you know, and uh, this kind of mixture between governmental power that regulates and these intergovernmental institutions that are um, really not controlled by parliaments, like, for example, the European Central Bank or the Troika or the Eurogroup or the ECOFIN, these would be uh, the relevant institutions here. Those are the ones who actually can dictate the economic guidelines. The sovereign states can uh, talk about their fiscal policy and price stability, and uh, but without the parliaments being able to actually have a say in this and without jurisprudence being able to interfere. And the best example here, of course, is the independence of the European Central Bank. And this, I think, is also something that may have reached the general public uh, already. The European Central Bank is responsible for maintaining price stability, and they want to do that sustainably. And that means that it needs to be protected against uh, you know, uh, the possible ups and downs of uh, politics and in the respective texts, so you can read that the body, that is the central bank, which is responsible for the liquidity of all our banks, that the, the central bank needs to be independent 
of political uh, officials who are interested in being re-elected. Or we can read that the, uh, the body needs to be immune against the dynamics of short time uh, confirmation by political powers. So the central bank needs to be independent. It needs to be autonomous of constitutional or governmental bodies. And we know that the central bank is responsible for lending money. They don't do this directly to states, but rather to private banks. The private banks who themselves, again, determine the criteria according to which they then lend money to states. And their power, that is the power of uh, the ECB, was shown in an impressive and exemplary fashion in the case of Greece. So the Greek government of Tsipras, um, you know, didn't just, uh, um, you know, give up because they felt like it and they liked the idea. No, the Greek uh, government, had, you know, had been strangulated right from the word go by the ECB in January and February even. You know, there was an exception uh, with a view to Greek bonds, they were no longer purchased by the ECB. Then there was this EA liquidity, which uh, meant that uh, it was rather a drop in the, in the ocean, the way that they were giving money. And after this, um, after this uh, popular vote, the uh, in a flow of money was stopped altogether. And after that, Tsipras then had to go down on his knees. So this is actually a kind of uh, political action that was entirely and completely forced uh, to happen by the uh, purportedly independent ECB. So the focus has been shifted. The national parliaments have now passed on their pow powers to uh, transnational intergovernmental financial institutions. And in a Europe of this quality, the um, you know equal rights on a political basis are of secondary importance. So things have developed into this situation. It was a kind of creeping development. And now the importance and the right to co-determination of the individual partners is now measured against their economic performance. So those who uh, actually fulfilled the stability criteria as best as possible, who have good um, export uh, balances and who have good economic uh, surpluses and uh, they get a vote that is worth more than that of the others and that is also how we can understand or how i try to understand why germany is playing such an important role because who's got the best uh, marks and who's got uh, whose say is the most important in uh, europe that is germany we are now in uh, one of these uh, you know, situations where there is a post-democratic uh, architecture with uh, Germany at the helm. Ulrich Beck, and we know that Ulrich Beck is one of uh, the people who was actually an advocate of the European idea for quite some time. And in his last book, before he died, he actually was uh, um, shocked by the idea of a German Europe. And he's talking about an empire state, uh, you know, um, going back to Max Weber's ideas. And he says that, that Germany, although it's formally not forced to do so, but in times of crisis as the biggest creditor, it now has regained new power. And it can now actually push through its policies through um, all kinds of odds without being politically uh, legitimized to do that. So that's one thing. But the other thing is really the formal legitimacy of the actions of Germany. Because uh, German, uh, German responsibilities are also enshrined in EU law. The former foreign uh, minister of the former Greek uh, government, uh, Mr. Kotsias, says that the EU has taken over the economic culture of Germany. We know that many EU institutions have been built on the model of Germany, and the ECB, for example, is uh, actually... Uh, also shaped uh, after the German Bundesbank. And uh, we know that uh, Germany is also exporting its economic policies to Europe. We can see the implementation of uh, what's called the break debt, sovereign break debt, or the deregulation of the labor market and the lowering of social standards. And Mr. Kotzias, uh, and I'm quoting him because I'm coming back to my theory of neocolonialism, it's very um, interesting to see how a former foreign minister of Greece is saying this. And he wrote a whole book on that with the title of Greece as a debt colony, a European empire and Germany's 
primacy. Um, primacy. It unfortunately has only been published in Greek, and it would be very interesting to see what kind of discussion uh, could be had in Germany. And it's interesting that Germany had, does not only have an advisory function within Europe, but also a controlling function, according to what he said. So the sovereignty rights in the different European states are not being passed on and uh, given up to the equal measure, but the indebted states actually pass on their sovereignty rights to the creditor states, especially to Germany. And he describes that there is a very differentiated control and supervision system that is enshrined in the memoranda and that actually has been uh, uh, decreed from up above into the field of Greek policies or rather Greek politics. Um, I don't know how things will evolve from here, but before the Tsipras uh, government um, was elected, this kind of monitoring and supervisory system was very differentiated indeed. We uh, recall the so-called task force. That was a group of 400 civil servants in 25 working groups, and the German diplomat Reichenbach was heading the whole thing, and they were all sitting in Greek ministries, at least in those that were of some importance, like uh, the uh, Ministry for uh, Finances and in uh, other central ministries, or Mr. Fuchtel, you know, so they even have the matching names. You know, Mr. Fuchtel, Mr. Reichenbach, so Mr. Fuchtel, for example, was responsible to uh, explore for mineral resources in, Greek, in Greece or to find the potential for hydropower. And uh, this is a control that really is uh, very, very finely attuned into the last detail. They wanted to have the lists of names of people who were laid off. They want to know whether the opening hours of pharmacies were changed and what uh, you can find in libraries. So nothing is left to chance in this system of control. And Mr. Kutsias said that the aspect of supervision and control was a central characteristic feature of neocolonial dominance. And he says uh, that it would be appropriate to call Greece a debt colony. Um, I don't want to put too much pressure on your attention here. I don't want to exert you too much. So a debt colony. It would really be interesting to discuss uh, this idea and how far it's true. I mean, in material terms, I'd say that uh, we could actually prove this to be true. And now uh, I'm, I'm trying to skip a part of my uh, manuscript uh, in order to not overtax you. Um, so we could now ask ourselves why this kind of, you know, scandalous state of things, you know, that we have an economic debt colony inside of Europe. Now we could ask ourselves why people, why there is no public outcry. Now, Ulrich Becker has been criticizing this or has criticized this for quite some time, why this has not turned into a, 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 a scandal over the years. And Kotsias says that the neocolonial character of these activities are somewhat obfuscated. There is no military intervention in Greece. But I'm saying that in public, this is being legitimized. And there are reasons that the public accept for that. And this is the last part of my presentation. And as a cultural scholar, not as a political uh, scientist, I would like to now look into the question of how this relationship of dominance and, and, uh, and, uh, and of, 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 you know, governing Greece from outside, how this was actually justified in the German public discourse. It was uh, legitimized by a narrative that actually depreciates and uh, the uh, those states that are affected by, um, you know, using the cultural specifics of the southern states in general and of the Greek in particular. This mechanism of legitimizing a power politics by devaluing foreign cultures is not new at all, and it really is banal. It is a cultural construction of, um, you know, collective identities and the popular mentalities of the southern states, of the image of yourself and of the other, and a discourse of us versus them that uh, really hit the headlines of all German media, more or less, and that really was seen as a serious argument and was accepted as such. 
And this mechanism you know, of uh, cultural debasement is something that has been described in the context of post-colonial discourse. Uh, Edward Said, for example, in his uh, famous uh, Orientalism studies is speaking of the construction of the other. He's talking about the construction of a homogeneous image of what uh, the West wanted to call the Orient. And one of the effects of classifying the other is to legitimize to the, the treating uh, differently of these people. So they, they are different, and that is why we can treat them differently, and that's why we are entitled to de treat them differently. And uh, traditionally, Zayed says that this kind of debasing um, of the other is actually the reason for why you can exclude them, why you can exert power over them, why you can act as an authority over them. And it's also an argument for dehumanizing these people, like Sartre called it with a view to the colonies during the time of the war in Algeria. And it's very important that the other is seen as the other of a lower value and also to perceive them as a threat. You know, that is something that in the spirit of a civilizational project, they need to be adopted and they need to be dominated. So we've heard this time and again. Of course, it's nothing new. But what's interesting is that it can actually be applied to the crisis in Greece. And in the case of the euro crisis, I think it's a, an economist variation of this kind of debasing cultural construction of the other. Just think of the term of the so-called pigs state. These are the economically unstable uh, creditor st uh, um, states, or rather debtor states, I'm, I'm sorry. These are called pigs states, not human states, pigs, like they are of lower value and they are disgusting and hostile at the same time. So in this context and in the way that I tried to embed this conflict into the discourse of neocolonialism, I think we could talk of a form of economic racism. This is a kind of process where the respective part of the population is seen as a third rate economic beings that for biological and cultural reasons are just not able to understand the workings of the economy and who are um, exclusively responsible for their weakened state of being. So being exclusively responsible is also part of the typical argumentation vis-a-vis -vis the global south. You know, the dependence theory is talking about this. And, uh, you know, it's being said that, uh, you know, the misery, the state of misery of the global south is due to endogenous factors like a lack of capital or the cultural characteristic traits of the population and you know how they are uh, just uh, brought up and their character traits they just can't pay taxes quite apparently and that this is, the, these endogenous factors are actually responsible for a lack of modernization that never happened at least not uh, following a western pattern dependency theory would say it's just the other way around. These are external factors and the hierarchical dependency between the metropolis and the periphery that would uh, limit the peripheries and that for the long run puts them into a disadvantageous position. And the argument that the euro architecture or the architecture of the euro sustainably leads to the fact that the countries at the periphery of Europe have to have um, higher imports than exports because you can't have the same currency with the different economic output in different countries, that would be an argument following the ideas of the dependency theory from the overall post-colonial discourse. So I was talking about uh, this uh, move of debasing and devaluing a different country or different peoples. And we know from many different studies that in Germany, this mentality of, well, it's their own fault actually managed to assert itself. The crisis was reduced and boiled down to a Greek crisis. It was never called a Euro crisis. And it was also analyzed by looking at the mentality of the Greek people. And the argumentation follows the schematics of us versus them. The constructed others are the, the Greek. They form a homogenous group of Greeks who are all the same. And they are just not able, they are lazy, they are not reliable and unprofessional. And thirdly, they are pity thieves and crooks, and uh, they are cons, and they are basically, well, pity criminals. And with that, they also represent a threat both to Germany and Europe. So again, we can see this kind of uh, 
double shift or double movement, you know, that uh, they are both termed uh, to be less valuable than Germans and they are a threat. I'm going to now skip the uh, part of my text uh, um, that's talking about why there were arguments that try to construct the Greek as non-Europeans. The German newspaper Die Welt uh, published an article last spring where they quite seriously said that the Greek really are not Europeans because they are rather more of Turkish or Slavic descendants. And this is an argument, by the way, that was rather popular during the Nazi era, where the Greek were then uh, displayed as the illegitimate uh, um, the illegitimate heirs of uh, the Hellenistic peoples, you know, in order to say that the German Aryans are the true successors of the Hellenic people. And this, again, is typical for uh, colonial discourse or a neo-colonial discourse. You know, this Said, for example, describes how people went to the uh, Middle East and how it was uh, depreciated um, as compared to the past, you know, the past Middle East, the past Greek can only be explored and explained by modern Western scholars. And uh, now let me come to the conclusion. This uh, new construction, uh, the negative construction of the other is, of course, the downside of your own identity as the positive kind of uh, self-image of Germans, of all Germans, you know, if they are all crooks and if they are all lazy in Greece, then it implicitly says that we are all punctual and, uh, and work hard and pay our taxes. And this kind of constructed German is the role model for Europe. It's the teacher uh, for the uh, infantilized Greek who still first of all have to do their homework, but it's also the role model for being a helper. And this helper discourse is nothing new either in the uh, post-colonial discourse. Franz Fanon, for example, in his book, The Wretched of the Earth, is talking about the concern of the West vis-a-vis -vis the underdeveloped colonies and uh, to call their interventions um, efforts or aid and support programs is a rhetoric that we are very familiar with. You know, the cre credit packages or the loan packages or the memorandum are now being called uh, um, financial aid packages. So people see themselves as helpers, not just vis-a-vis -vis the Greek, but also vis-a-vis -vis the refugees. And what the, these helpers now claim is a sense of gratitude. And what is this German us, the positive German us? I'd say it's a national kind of us. It's a kind of national evocation, or they try to evoke a, a new form of nationalism and hidden in this new uh, nationalism is the character of the German taxpayer, uh, taxpayer, which is my favorite character. You know, to uh, call upon the um, imagined uh, national community follows the line of all of us being uh, taxpayers. It's an interesting construction of national identity because one could say that it's uh, not an image of the people as a sovereign or the citizens that uh, then form a national collective uh, that unifies all of the people, but it's rather the economic position that links everyone together. And I would now like to formulate the theory of a new form of economic nationalism without blood or relationship or uh, you know um, s uh, language or culture that, by, uh, that links people. Now, it, you know, this new German Joe Average should not feel like, uh, you know, uh, someone who is working for a wage and who is getting uh, too little money for his uh, for his work. They should not feel like a voter or anything. They should feel like a taxpayer, like someone who is performing. And of course, in this role, they share the interests of other high performers, uh, like, for example, our bankers and our politicians. And together with our bankers and politicians, all of us are victims and we are victims of the Greek. So uh, he, that is the German taxpayer, as well as his banks, are spending billions on these others, on the Greek. And what about him? 
It's the fear of the Germans of losing their social position in the uh, position in the European crisis. This is a fear that's not being addressed to those who have, but rather to the have-nots who are not paying, those who are not paying their taxes. And this economic nationalism turns out to be a form of classism, classism because non-payers are also social welfare recipients, but also refugees, housewives, and all kinds of social parasites and people who are sick and ill, and among them, the ungrateful Greek. And with that, I'll come to my conclusion. Based on this gratitude that is uh, being claimed, I once went to a talk, uh, a TV talk show, and I was, uh, you know, reproached with not being grateful enough for the aid coming out of Germany. And uh, Fanon would actually say, that this claim for gratitude um, actually is proof of an impressive form of amnesia of the West of Europe and Germany vis-a-vis -vis its own past. And uh, with this past, uh, you know, how this past is somehow intertwined with the others. Those authors who look at the Greek crisis from a post-colonial perspective, they are actually baffled as to this amnesia, also with a view to the um, imagination of a European identity that is now threatened uh, with falling apart. And Sadia Abirs, for example, who's a scholar from the uh, Rutgers University, and he writes in the Greek Left uh, Review that Europe has always been a fiction. From the point of view of the colonies, it has also been a vicious fiction. When Europeans talk about the ideals of peace and prosperity, of forgetting the violence of the two world wars, it is hard not to see this as a remarkable exercise in the creation of a collective innocence, fully dependent upon an erasure of the past. We are not to think of settler colonialism, racial slavery, the immiseration of the South and the East, the touting of the civilizational burden of what was in truth white supremacist colonialism of the Congress of Berlin, but instead are to fall for a romance of a European Union based on rights, law, social democracy. The romance of the European Union was always to enable a certain amnesia. So amnesia vis-a-vis -vis your own past as part of the past of other countries, uh, as part of the history of other countries. And this strange disease of amnesia both is true for uh, the colonial history of individual countries, and this also becomes apparent during this current refugee catastrophe, as it's called, but also with a view to the structural adjustment programs in the Global South and how it failed. And in the case of Germany, I would just like to mention two cases of amnesia, which are important in the Greek discourse. Uh, the amnesia with a view to the debt conference in 1953, where uh, Germany was um, given a haircut of 50% of its wartime debts, and also with a view to the amnesia, with a view to the horrific deeds of the Nazis in Greece and the reparation payments that were never done, and the enforced credits that were never paid back to Greece either. And so I would now like to end quoting an article from, uh, from a Greek author who is looking at Namibia as a former colony of Germany in Africa. So in Greece, there is a discourse on Namibia now, and the title of this article is Let's Become Namibia, and I would like to subscribe to that. Namibia, you may be familiar with that. This is when the German as colonial masters uh, killed more than 60,000 people, and it was the last July when a delegation from Namibia visited Germany asking German government officials to assume historical rem responsibility for that. And the author of this article also says that the Greek politicians should work for making sure that these uh, still unpaid debts of Germany should be paid. And now what's happening? Well, the, as Fanon would say, the Greeks still have um, a desire to be part of the body of Europe, but there is not the kind of self-image that without the dependency that you could be independent from this new neo-colonial structure and that one could carry on without the structure. People believe that they have to stick to this existing body. And Franz Fanon, actually, in his book, The Wretched of the Earth, says that the bourgeois uh, classes and the intellectuals 
of the colonies uh, keep saying that, well, we can't become independent because we alone would never manage. And this is something that I think so far has been the opinion of the Greek public and the Greek government. And uh, it's really rather uncertain as to what will happen in the foreseeable future. But we have the debts, and the debts are a ticking time bomb. And they will decide about how time will progress in the future. And with this jump in time, in a performative fashion, I would like to end this whole uh, talk on the crisis and neocolonialism and post-democracy in Greece. I just tried to come up with a possible answer to the question that is raised by this festival as a, you know, a strategic and very subjectively motivated effort to look at the now and what's happening in Europe and in Greek, looking at the time horizons of the post-colonial past. Thank you very much.